In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. Give us the grace of full surrender. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, which is not a cowardly spirit, but one that will make us strong, loving, and wise. That we may live your will all the days of our lives. We beg you these things, Holy Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Mary, Mother of Jesus, pray for us. Good Saint Joseph, pray for us. Are you ready? I don't think so. Anyway, gentlemen, if you've heard me before and some of you say you listen to me a lot and this sounds very loud for whatever reason and, and I just get louder so if you can turn me down you better. So anyway, the reality is that my style, if you haven't got it yet, I'm a little abrasive. Huh? I come walking in this morning, I told the people, turn off the secular music. This isn't a thing. They, Are you kidding, Father? No, I'm not kidding. It's the day of surrender. So you put the secular aside. You focus on Jesus. And there is no, okay, let's try. No, it's about giving your life to Christ. And that's what this surrender talk is about, gentlemen. It's about stopping the excuses we have for why we fit God into our life. And we decide we're going to build our life around God and stop making excuses for why we don't. And so the first thing you need to do is to be a man is you need a weapon. And the weapon that you need as if you ever see St. Paul, St. Paul always has in his hand what? A sword. Why does he have a sword in his hand? Because the word, it's going to be a long talk. The word of God is a two-edged sword. Now most of the churches in America, when you see St. Paul, I don't know, I think Paul's out there and as soon as he walked in, most of the time Paul has a sword and it's down. You know, wimpy Paul. That ain't what we're talking about. If you go to St. Paul outside the wall in Rome, there's this humongous statue of Paul and there he is and his sword is high, ready for a fight. Gentlemen, we need to have our swords to do battle. When we surrender, that's not about going and retreating and going and being defeated. It's about fighting and willing to give up our life. That's the surrender that we're talking about this day. And so what you need to do that is you need the sword. And the sword is the word of God. So let me see how many brought their swords today. <sighs> Turn in your man cards, gentlemen. The rest of you who did not bring a sword, just give them up. You know, Phil, where's Phil? Is Phil over there? Where's the Phil guy? Where's your, where's your Bible? You have your Bible, Phil? Oh, your phone. Shut up. That doesn't count. You know. Anyway, today, it, when you go to Mass today, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal gospel today. Unless they change it on me, but they shouldn't, I would think. If you're going to go to the Mass, and you are going to go, and our bishop's going to be there... It's the call of Levi, huh? And afterwards, it's, this is in Matthew, for those five of you who have your Bibles, this is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 and following. After he went out and saw a tax collector named, named Levi sitting at his customs post, he said to him, follow me. And the next line says, leaving everything behind. Levi stood up and became his follower. Gentlemen, have you given everything up for Christ yet? Are you still one of those ones that, you know, tiptoe in the tulips and put your toe in and say, I wonder how this is going to be. Gentlemen, God's not interested in you trying him out. I used to sit there and I was a newly ordained priest. I've been ordained this next month, 25 years. And I'm more excited about being a priest today than I was 25 years ago. And... I used to go and my friend had a, a youth mass at this one parish near EPA and there was kids, I walked in there once because we were going to go out for uh, some food after his mass, it was 7.30 at night and there's all these kids, I walk in the back vestibule and all these high school kids are sitting in there facing out. You know, there's the vestibule and it was all enclosed and they're sitting there gossiping, facing out, telling jokes and mass is going on behind them. And so I walked in there in my gentle style and I said, you get in or you get out. You don't sit here, just get in or you get the hell out of the church. I'm sorry, this is live on radio. Anyway, so come to think of it, I'll have to be very good today. But anyway, and then one of the ushers came running to me and says, Oh, Father, oh, Father, at least they're here. <coughs> oh. 
You see, that's the garbage we've put up on throughout the years. At least they're here, they're trying. That's garbage. You would not accept that, those of you who belong, or are football coaches and different things. I consider myself a spiritual coach. You know, you sit there, I was talking to the West the Catholic yesterday, you know, and their football, the state champions and all this kind of stuff over there. Ooh. Now, you sit there, and you were your coach. Some of you might be coaches, huh? And you have a kid, and you sit there, and you have rules to just to play your miserable game. Huh? And those rules are, you will be at practice every day. You're not going to call me and tell me you can't come to practice today because you got a toothache. Ah, oh, suck it up. You will be there at practice. If you miss one practice, you will not play in the game this weekend. I don't care your mother died. You will be there at that practice. You understand? And we demand these things for sports. And yet when it comes to God, we make him Barney. Oh, guys. Can, can, you, can, you, can you show up to church every once in a while? Oh, please, don't get mad at me. As long as it's not a nice day in Grand Rapids and you can't go golfing, could you could at least try to come to church? And could, 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 could you try to be a good person? That's garbage. You see, don't you get it? God is a God of love. And what's the greatest of all commandments that Jesus Christ gave us? He says, this is the greatest of all commandments. What is it? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength, period. Because, gentlemen, the day you drop dead, let's say, for instance, bang, you died right there of a heart attack. Right there you died. Boom, you had a heart attack right there. And God says to you, I love you very much, gentlemen. You are my beloved son. I will now give you what you love the most forever. And, gentlemen, what you love the most is what you give your time to, period. So let's say you drop dead right then and the God of love looks at you and says, okay man, you always wanted to be in charge of your life, you're in charge, okay, I'll give you what you want. This is what you want, what you give your time to. So for some of you, it'd be sports. Ooh, you get to play forever. You'll get tired of it. Some of you will be sexuality. Ooh, huh? After a while, a couple hundred million years, you're going to be really tired. Trust me. You know, it'd be money. Oh, you'll get all kind of money you want, but you're not going to be able to spend it. Don't you get it? When God tells us to love, all, uh, love him of all things created, why does he tell us that? Because that's the way he loved us, above all things created. Talk about surrender. Whenever you look at a crucifix, here's a God who surrendered everything for love of you. And any kind of relationship demands love back. Life for a life. So the question really is today, have you completely surrendered your life to Jesus? Completely. Completely. No excuses. That means you have a daily committed prayer time. If the answer is no, you're a liar. If you tell me you've committed your life to Christ, you're a complete liar. Don't even want to hear it. I don't even want to hear the excuses. If you don't have a daily committed prayer life because God's not your priority, it's just that simple. He just isn't. And so you've got to decide whether he's important enough to you. But if he's not important, like I taught all boys for eight years, huh? We had anywhere from 650 to 700 boys in our Catholic high school where I was in charge of campus ministry, huh? One year we had 666 boys. 666, the sign of the Antichrist, huh? So we threw one out the first week to get rid of that number. But anyway... <laughs> As I was talking, I used this yesterday, and I was talking to the high school kids. My big fight with the kids every day, and with the teachers, was God must become the most important thing in your life. And they would do just like some of you. You know, some of you, I look at your faces as I'm looking, and some of you look constipated at this moment. You know, you get that look on your face like, just shut up, Father. I can't even take you now, and you just started talking. And when I say you're constipated, it's another way of saying what? You're full of, exactly, that's exactly what I'm saying. But again, because we want to be challenged in everything except for the spiritual life. That's exactly the truth. You know, if you get a good, you want to be a good football player, you want to be a good basketball player, what do you do? Come on, coach, tell me what to do. I want to be the best, coach, I want to be the best. And if your coach looks at you and says, I like you just the way you are. <laughs> Could you show up to practice when you feel like it once a week for 45 minutes to an hour, depending what coach we got? And, and could you try to have good thoughts about the game? What would you do with that coach? <laughs> Get out of here! What kind of man are you? And yet that's what we want from our priests. 
We just want our priest to tell us, oh guys, God loves you just the way you are. Could you try to be a good person? Could you try to show up and try to not break the commandments? That's just garbage. Jesus says it's all or nothing. He doesn't want a man that's partly committed to him. He doesn't want a man who's going to try. He wants a man who's going to be a man who's going to lay down his life for him. Huh? The reason I wrote the book Be a Man years ago is because after teaching boys for eight years, the boys are looking to sports stars and TV stars and movie stars and uh, people who played in bands as their heroes. And I'm thinking, really? That's what a hero is? Just because you can play football, that makes you a hero because you can throw a football? Really? You're a big shot because you can throw a football? And I know some of you played for his professional football. Ooh, huh? I'm good friends with Danny Abramowitz. God is a Steelers fan, as we all know, correct? <laughs> Do you even have a football team up here? Anyway, so the reality is that whenever you put your time and energy into these things, all those things are passing. You put your time and energy into things that nobody cares about in the long run. Again, we were state champions and uh, every sport there was a cathedral prep. Everything. And I was, a, I was the chaplain of the hockey team, the football team, the, all the things. I go to all the games, different things, and I always say, gentlemen, put this in perspective. Because like when we were state champions at the football, we beat Central Bucks West in Hershey, Pennsylvania about 15 years ago. Ten of my kids got full scholarships in the college. But when they get to be my age, and it's getting very fast, I'm going to be 54, they'll look at their sons and they'll say, Son, when I was your age, I was a state champion football player. And the boys are going to look at them and say, Oh, shut up, Dad. You're just fat and bald now. Nobody cares. <laughs> and yet, have you ever? There's nothing worse than an X star. Nothing. Because they're constantly trying to, hey, I used to be. Who cares? You're not anymore. You see, all those things you put hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours in, it doesn't matter and nobody cares. And yet your soul, which is eternal, you give the very least amount of time and energy and you expect eternal life? Really? So this is God. He says to make money, you're going to have to work hard. 40 hours a week, 60 hours a week, 80 hours a week. To be, you know, like people want to be in good shape. You know, oh, look at me. I got a six-pack. I work out every day. I don't care about your six-pack. I got a case. I could care less about your six-pack. And yet you do that. And I've been in a lot of funerals. I've buried a lot of people in 25 years. And I've never heard once, did you ever see the ripples in that guy's stomach? <laughs> never, never once. Right? Why? Because your ripples are now worm meat to the b worms. A muncha, muncha, muncha. And then you come out the other side and you become dust. Ooh, but I had ripples. Okay? Now I'm not saying football, basketball, sports, working out every day, making money is bad. I am not saying that in any way, shape, or form. In fact, if God gave you a gift, you've got to use that to the greatest ability. You must develop that. You must become the best in what you do. But what I am telling you is the most important thing in life is that you live forever. And when you drop dead, God will give you what you love the most forever. So you've got to make sure that the perspective is God's the most important thing in my life. You know, even as a father, those of you who are married, and not even as a father, if you're not married, you know, I'm not a father, I'm a father of many, but there's still the reality is this. The first thing it shows that we have surrendered our lives to God is we have committed daily prayer time. Period. Like if I was to ask you before I started this talk, and I was just to go down and grab one of you and say, come here, stand up here with me. And you come up and you think, I really don't like this guy. And I'm going to stand up there with him? Yeah. So you stand there and I say, did you pray yesterday? And most of you, like, uh, <laughs> I wish I could be hearing confessions at this time, but the way they got it settled, I won't be able to hear confessions. But the reality, I'll try to get in there when I can, but I have what we call the questions. And the questions will get you out of the confessional in less than 60 seconds. And we start, do you pray every day? Have you used God's name in vain? Have you missed mass? Have you dishonored your parents? Have you got angry? Have you hurt others with your words? Have you made fun of others? Have you helped someone have an abortion? Have you had impure thoughts, impure actions with self? Have you not married? I'll say oral sex to another, intercourse to another, married, artificial birth control? Have you uh, used... Uh, uh, committed adultery? Have you had sex with some of the same sex? Have you looked at pornography? Have you lied? Have you cheated? Have you stolen? Have you gossiped? Have you been jealous? Have you got drunk? Have you got high? Have you been judgmental? Have you been proud? Do you consistently take care of the poor? Is there anything else? 
Now, normally it's, yes, 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 yes. No, I'd never do that one, Father. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I think I like to try that one, Father. Whack! Yes, 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 yes. Is anything else? Yeah, I don't like cats, and I set one on fire to watch it burn once. <laughs> you are going to hell. Anyway, so... The very first question always is, do you pray every day? And the number one answer at every men's conference I ever get is, what do you think? I try. And I go, come here. Whack! You try. Do you try to eat every day? Well, well, no, Father. Do you try to read the paper every day? Well, well, no, Father. Do you try to go to work when you need to? Well, Well, no, Father. Then why do you try to pray? So if I was to ask you if you prayed every day, and you go, yesterday, and you go, no, Father, I didn't pray. Oh, okay, did you eat yesterday? Well, sure, Father. Well, then you love food more than you love God. Did you pray yesterday? Well, well, no, Father. Did you sit there and uh, 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 do what I watch television? Well, sure, the game was on yesterday, Father. How much time do you spend watching the game? Four hours? You love the game more than you love God. Gentlemen, you can't even begin to say you love Almighty God if you don't give him five minutes a day. You can't even begin to say it. I don't care you come and spend, oh, eight hours one day to listen to, uh, I was going to call her Sister Teresa, (laughs) Father Larry. Kind of right, Sister. Anyway, so the reality is, look what I did, huh? You got to have, this must be lived, gentlemen. Five minutes a day. So you take your five minutes a day. And again, think about it. If I was to ask you, gentlemen, if you knew someone was going to come into your house tonight and rape your wife and kill your children, would you take a bullet to stop them? Oh, don't sound too excited. I don't, I don't know, Father. You know, I'm not having good times with my wife right now, so I don't know if I'd actually take a bullet for him. Okay, really? Well, okay, I'm guessing that most of you would say you would die to save your wife and kids. Is that a good assumption? Yeah, thank you. Anyway, so, but the world, the flesh, and the devil is coming after your wife and kids every day. And if you're not a man of prayer, you leave them unprotected. Period. When we go back to Adam and Eve and to temptation, where was Adam during the temptation of Eve? Right next to Eve. The problem was he kept his mouth shut. The problem was he didn't protect his wife. Huh? That's the problem. And the reality is that we need to be people who are going to sit there and when you become this man of prayer, you stand before the world, the flesh, and the devil with the power of God and say, you got to go through me before you get to my wife and my kids. You got to go through me. But if you don't pray, you let the world, the flesh, and the devil go right after your kids because you're a wimp. You're too wimpy to pray. You can do everything else, but you can't pray. And you leave your family unprotected. And you, sir, will stand before Almighty God and be judged on that. Because he gave you your wife and kids that you would protect them. But because you're too busy and everything else, prayer isn't that important to you. And gentlemen, prayer must be your life. I do a holy hour every day of my life, and I've done a holy hour since I was 17 years old. Now, some people look at me and say, well, Father, we expect that of you. You're a priest. Really? I'm a pastor. I'm on the road 45 times a year giving talks. I have nine of those times. It's four-day missions when I have to do a four-night mission. I have written another two books. I'm sitting there constantly on the road. Sometimes I don't get home to 1 o'clock in the morning. And if I don't get home at 1 o'clock in the morning and I haven't said Mass or done my holy hour yet, I go down to the church. I begin to say Mass. I stop right before the Our Father. I do my holy hour of silence. And then I end. And if I don't get to bed till 2 o'clock in the morning, I don't get to bed till 2 o'clock in the morning. Why? Because God's my priority. And that shouldn't just be a priest. That should be every man, man here. Because in the end, that's the only thing that's going to matter to you. When you're laying in your deathbed, the only thing that's going to matter to you is that God was everything. Because he'll appear to you and say, okay, my son whom I love, I will now give you what you love the most. But now let me give you a little hint about why we don't surrender. Huh? Because we're afraid. We live our life in fear. You know, I have an anger problem. I don't know if you've noticed yet. (laughs) I went to two years anger management. I'm much better, thank you very much. But anyway, so... 
And I am much better. Thank you very much. I still can explode for stupid things, but that's part of the reality. But anger is a way we control things. It's a way we try to get control. Because when a man is angry, there's two things that are the problem. One or the other. Sometimes it's both. It's either because he is afraid or because he is hurt. And the way he protects himself is this anger. But the problem is, we try to control our families with it and everything else, we become these angry men. And the reason we become these angry men is because we haven't experienced that our Father in Heaven loves us. We think that our Father is always judging us. And so why should I surrender to that? Why should I surrender to another one? I don't know if you ever read the book Wild at Heart. Have you ever seen the book Wild at Heart, gentlemen? You know, so this uh, great book, it was one of the first books I read before I got involved in men's ministry. And uh, there he says, we all have a, me a father wound inside of us, correct? So we all go around, none of our fathers are perfect. You know, people come to me all the time and say, Father, I come from a dysfunctional family. Go, oh, join the crowd. Huh? We all come from dysfunctional families, huh? One day, I'm going to be downstairs, just today, I'm going to be downstairs at high school boys, huh? And they're going to say, Father, I come from a dysfunctional family. I go, yeah, I know, I met your father upstairs, I get it. <laughs> None of us are perfect people. None of us. I am by far one of the most imperfect priests. Sometimes I have a, you know, I say some bad words. You know, it's like, like the other day I was flying in from Austin, Texas. And as I was flying in from Austin, Texas, I even called because they told me my plane would be an hour late. So I called early in the morning. Can't you hold that plane because it's the last flight into Erie. I can't miss that flight. I got to have mass Sunday morning. Okay, Father, we'll try. So I get off an A schedule on, the, on A at Detroit Airport and I run and I had to go to see the other end and as soon as I got there they closed that door and they would not open it I swore <laughs> and it wasn't that bad of a swear word it begins with an S and ends with a T huh, it's all part it comes out of the body sometimes soft sometimes hard whatever it is it's just that reality but the woman looked at me and said you have to explain that to the person next to you I'm on radio live I can't say anything more anyway so when I said that word the woman looked at me and says I've never seen a priest swear before. And I says, well, you better not stand around here because I was just so mad. And yet the next day, the homily was on holiness. You know, how are we called to be holy when the priest of Jesus Christ is saying a swear word? Huh? We get up and we move on. None of us here are perfect. But what we got to keep doing is, Jesus, I give you my heart. Before I get out of bed every day, before I get out of bed in the morning, I fall on my knees and I say, Jesus, I give you my heart and my life. May your will be done in my life today. May I bring your name glory. So before I do anything else, I fall on my knees before Jesus and I surrender myself to him. Why? Because I love to take my life back. I love to be in control. And see, being in control of anything, gentlemen, is a lie. We think we're in control and we love to have control. I'm not a big flyer. I'd be a great flyer if I was the pilot. But I don't even like to drive in cars with other people, huh? You know, <laughs> I had a big picked up this morning from Ed and I just kept closing my eyes like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Because I hate to hand control over to anybody. I want to be in control. And we all do, gentlemen. We love that. And to hand over control, I can't do that unless I have such trust in this person. So I can't hand over everything to God until I have this great trust. So in the book, Be a Man, Often people say, Father, what's the most important uh, chapter of the book? And they always think I'm going to say chapter 3, which is repent. Be a man who repents. But no, 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 not even close. The most important chapter of the book is chapter 2. It says, be a man who knows that you are God's beloved son. Because until you know that, you're not going to want to pray. You're not going to want to come to God. Because who wants to You know, gentlemen, if you go to God because of fear, and that's your God... You can have that. I would reject that. If that's the way God is, I don't want to be with him for a day as opposed to forever. If I have to be afraid forever that I'm not doing something right, that he's going to get mad at me, okay, okay, I'm going to hell then. That's that simple. At least I don't have to live up to any expectations. When you and I come before God, God is love. And so with Jesus and his humanity, what had to happen in him and Jesus, I'm going to make you memorize a verse of the Bible. Can you think you can handle this, gentlemen? Yes. 
The first who said maybe hit him. Anyway, the, there you go, hit him again. So the reality is, you have to remember three numbers. Can you remember three numbers? First number is one. What's the first number? One. Second number is one. What's the second number? One. Third number is one. There you go. What's the third number? One. So what are the three together? One, one, one. You think we can handle this? Yeah, I can't. Hey, can you help me? I can't remember what Father said this morning. What did he want us to memorize? And then just hit the person that does that. One, one, one. Mark chapter one, verse eleven. Get it, gentlemen. Memorize it. Put it under, uh, underline it in your Bibles, and spend time with it every day this week. Did everything come out okay, Phil? Yeah, good. Anyway, so and get one, 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 and memorize it every. Spend time with it until you get it. And when I mean get it. That means the God of the universe touches you in your heart the way you've never been touched before. In Mark chapter 1 verse 11, it's the baptism of Jesus Christ. And the baptism of Jesus Christ, God the Father looked at Jesus and said, You are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. You are God's beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Gentlemen, the deepest need in everyone's heart is to be loved, period. And we try everything in our life to fill up the emptiness. And we find out that it doesn't work. Oh, I know, if I sit there and if I get drunk, some people here are alcoholics. You don't know it yet, but your family does. And so you think, this is going to make me happy. I'm going to drink. Isn't it amazing? You got to do it again the next day. You got to do it again the next day. You got to do it again the next day. You got to do it again the next day. Some of you think it might be pornography in your little fantasy world. And you sit there and you look at porn and you are impure yourself. And so what do you got to do? You do it again the next day. 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 Some of you think it's money. Okay, and you work really, really hard. You get all this money. And then most people who commit suicide, statistically, are rich people not poor. You mean if I have all this money and I get more and more, I'm not going to be happy? I promise you that's the case. I promise you. And I said, anything you try, you're going to try to fill up that need to be loved by all these things. Do you know what sin does? Is sin makes your hole bigger. The more you try to fill it with sin, the more it becomes bigger. You need to spend time with your father every day. And with your father, you need him to love you. You know, when I do my holy hour, I have to do my bereavery part, so about 30 minutes of my holy hour is saying the rosary, doing Divine Mercy Chaplet, saying my bereavery. The next 30 minutes of my holy hour is letting the God of the universe speak to me and love me. Because if not, then what I do is I come and I preach from me, not from God. I preach out of a need instead of the power and strength of God. That I have to know more than anything that I am beloved to my father before I can tell anybody else that reality. When I was in seminary, you know, I'm, I'm a spiritual director of a lot of seminarians in our diocese, and I always tell them, you need to do a holy hour every day or I want you to leave the seminary. And they always look at me like, huh? I said, if you're not going to come to know Jesus now and love Jesus and want to spend time with Jesus more than any other person on earth, you're going to be a horrible priest. Huh? When I do, I do deacon retreats and with their wives, and I do priest retreats more than ever. And I just tell the same thing to the fathers. Fathers, deacons, if you're not praying, please leave the ministry. Because we bring terrible disservice to people when we don't pray. And if I will say that to priests and deacons, I more than must say that to you. Because, gentlemen, the world wants to see Jesus, and they're not going to see Jesus if you and I aren't with him every day and bringing him to the world. The world is not. The only thing the world's going to do is get to go to hell if they get to know Father Larry Richards. Who cares? They got to know Jesus. And there's a great story. I talk about it in uh, one of my things. I don't know where it is. <laughs> you know, there's a little helicopter up here. Whose helicopter? This is really nice. Oh, sorry. Is this a joke for later? I'm messing up. Oh, sorry. Anyway, so there's this helicopter. <laughs> but 
Here's a story about a man who was captured in the Second World War. And he was an American, he was a Christian, and he was fighting, of course, the Japanese caught him and he was thrown in a prisoner of war camp. Now at that time, at the same time, there was a Japanese man who was trying to help the Americans and he was captured. But he was a traitor. The American they treated poorly, but not as badly as they treated the Japanese man. The Japanese man, they treated him so poorly. Uh, and tortured him so bad they would deprive him of food and just torture him and they'd throw him in the cell with the American every night and the American would take his own food what little he had and give it to the Japanese man and he'd try to heal the wounds of the Japanese man as best he could after about three weeks the Japanese man was tortured so bad that when he got thrown back in the cell with the American the American knew that this man was gonna die and so he thought you know I've shared everything with this man except for Jesus everything with this man except for Jesus and he knelt down next to him and he says, you know, you're probably going to die tonight. But you don't have to be afraid. If you just surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you will live forever. You know what the Japanese man said to the American? He said, if this Jesus is anything like you, I can't wait to meet him. Could people say that about us? Gentlemen, could your wives look at you and say, oh honey, if Jesus Christ is anything like you, I can't wait to meet him. Could your kids say that about you, those of you who are fathers? Oh, Dad, if Jesus is anything like you, I can't wait to meet him. Boys, could your friends at school say that to you? Oh, Joe, if Jesus Christ was anything like you, I can't wait to meet him. Is that who we are? And the reason we're not, and again, let's talk a moment about Jesus. Jesus was not a gentle, tiptoe through the tulips type person, in case you're wondering. In my book, I talk about, and it's not done because I want you to do it. I want you to go to the Gospels, and I want you to, with a pen and paper in hand, and take a month to do it, I want you to start with Matthew's Gospel, and go through John, and I want you to look at Jesus Christ, and I want you to write down his characteristics as a man. You'll find out, very rarely does he have this image that we make him, this la-la person who's always saying gentle things. Jesus would not be accepted by most of us here if he came. And he would not be accepted in most of our churches because he challenged people. Remember Peter? Peter's one of his intimate followers. And then he sits there and when Peter's trying to help him out and he says, oh, remember Jesus talks about he has to go to the cross? I'm going to have to suffer and go to the cross. And Peter, who's trying to be a good guy, comes up to him and says, Jesus, come here. Don't say that, Jesus. And what does Jesus say to him in front of everybody? He's not even politically correct, saying, Oh, Peter, my soon-to-be pope, here, I need to talk to you about this privately. Come here. You shouldn't say that about me. That's not a good thing. What does Peter do? What does Jesus do? Yes. Get thee behind me, Satan. Huh? The leader of the pack? He just called out in front of everybody, and he didn't do it in a gentle way. He didn't say, tiptoe through the tulips. Oh, Peter, I love you so. You are so misguided in what you say. He said, get behind me, Satan. You're looking at the world, not as God sees it, but as the world sees it. That's Jesus. That's the God we follow. But this God, this man who loves us so much, that he would die for love of us. Only a man will die for love of others. Only a man will give up your life for everything. Again, when I wrote the book, I was sitting there thinking, what the most boys, how do they become men, most boys today? If they want to be a man, what the most, <laughs> if they want to be not a man in the world's eyes, but a true man, what will they do? They'll join the service. They'll become a uh, Marine, Army, Navy, whatever, Air Force, they'll join one of these things. And when you join the service, the first couple of weeks is when they treat you the most gentle, is it not? <laughs> Guys, we are so glad you came to be part of us. Is there anything we can do to make your lives better? I'm going to sit there and make your life better. No, no, no. They put you through torture to make you a man. They deprive you of things. They make you work hard. That's just so be a man on this world, of this earth. And again, so much more must it be for a man who's going to live forever. And every man who comes out of the other side of boot camp, hopefully is willing to lay down their life for their country.
The question of us is, are you willing to lay down your life for him who laid down his life for you? And that got to be a day in, day out laying down our lives. It's not an easy way to live. So when everybody tells you, nowhere did Jesus say, if you come follow me, I'm going to make your life happy. Nowhere does it say, as a matter of fact, John's gospel, it says, in the world you will have trouble, but have confidence because I have overcome the world. When Our Lady at Fatima says, I can never promise you happiness on earth. Listen, gentlemen, if the mother of God can't promise you happiness on earth, neither can anybody else. The question is, will you lay down your life for Jesus every day by beginning making sure you give him quality time in prayer? Five minutes. Think about it, gentlemen. Five minutes? If you can't go give five, some of you, especially those of you who are older, spend more time on the toilet every day, don't you? You know you do. It takes more time to come out as you get older. As I've heard, I'm not that old yet. But the reality is that so you might spend five and you read the paper and you sit there and you spend ten minutes on the toilet every day. What are you going to do when you come before God on Judgment Day and he'll say, how come you spent more time on the toilet than you did talking to me? And you're going to say what? When you got to go, you got to go, Jesus, huh? So the first thing I'm asking you to do when it comes to surrender is are you willing to lay down your life for Christ? And if it's like, yes, Father, of course I will, yeah! Well, then you start with your time. You start by promising Almighty God there will never be one day for the rest of your life you don't give God at least five minutes of your day. Not, don't, and don't you dare look at me and say, okay, Father, I'll try. Try nothing. You know, again, when I, we have perpetual adoration in my parish. I'm the only church in the whole Diocese of Erie with perpetual adoration. And again, we got it because I'm a persistent type person. I went, we had an old bishop, Bishop Troutman, great man, but we didn't always see eye to eye. I don't know if you could ever imagine that. But <laughs> I asked him if I could start perpetual adoration. He goes, no. And so I asked him again a couple of weeks later. I told you no. So I start building the adoration chapel. And so when I start doing that, I went and I took a medal of a miraculous medal and I went and I put it at the feet of St. Joseph. And I said, Joseph, the bishop said no. But I know you'll say yes. And so I went to see the bishop again. I said, Bishop, he said, I told you no, Larry. I said, uh, St. Joseph already said yes. I don't care who said yes. I said no. So when he came and blessed the Adoration Chapel, it was quite <laughs> exciting. And one of the things is that when he came there and he, he says, Larry, why do you want this Adoration Chapel? Because I said, for the holiness of my people. Because at my parish, you cannot be an extraordinary minister of Holy Communion unless you do a holy hour. Right? Because you have to have extraordinary devotion to be an extraordinary minister. Some of you people sit there and say, Oh, look how holy I am. Body of Christ, body of Christ, blood of Christ, blood of Christ. I am so holy. Prove you're holy. You give an extra hour to God every week. Then you can come up here and pretend to be holy in front of everybody else. So I have 160 Eucharistic ministers in my parish. Every one of those 160 spend a holy hour every, every once, at least once a week. Every single one of them. Or they won't be an extraordinary minister. Now some people have left my parish. Can you imagine? And they went to the cathedral, because I'm on 24th and the cathedral's on 10th Street. And there's a whole group down here called the I Hate Father Larry Richards group, huh? <laughs> and one of the reasons they do that is because Father Larry is too demanding. I'm very demanding. And I go, yeah, when you're dying on your deathbed, you're going to be really mad that your pastor told you to spend an extra hour a week with Jesus Christ. And what I do with the men, I don't let the women do it alone at night. They're not allowed, because women, I can get to do anything. You know, women will do anything you ask them. Oh, I thank God for the women of the church. But men? Well, what's in it for me? I'm very busy, Father. You know, I have a life. Oh, please. So this is the reality. They got to do theirs in the middle of the night. That's when I do mine. Like yesterday when I got here, I, had, I woke up at 2.30 in the morning, did my holy hour from 3 to 4, had mass, took a shower, and went to the airport and came here. And so I make the men do it in the middle of the night. Now, some of the men give me pushback. I can't imagine this. Can you imagine giving me pushback because I'm telling them they have to pray an hour in the middle of the night once a week? And every time they do that, I say, okay, guys, oh, who am I? I'm, I know. I am so like someone's over there said, Father, you're out of touch. Really? Well, I said to them, how about, gentlemen, I ask you to do something? Let's say, if I made you this promise that if you do an hour a week in the middle of the night for one year, I will give you at the end of the year one million dollars would you do it you know everybody here would 
then why wouldn't you do it for Jesus Christ? Why would you do it for money? Gladly, gladly. You mean, do you mean, Father, the only thing I got to do, the only thing I got to do is pray for one hour in the middle of the night, once a week for a year, and you're going to give me a million bucks? Yep, I'll bet you you'd make that happen. I'll bet you'd put everything on hold. Hey, this is for a million dollars. Well, gentlemen, you can get that million dollars and drop dead. This is for eternal life. And so when you stand before God on judgment and you're dying there, you'll never sit there and regret the pastor that's out there and says, you'll never regret that you meant to spend an extra hour with Jesus every week. You know, I say, who am I stupid? I can't believe I spent an extra hour with Jesus Christ once a week. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Bet you it will never, I'll bet you that day will never come. I promise you it never will. Because then you'll be able to prove to God, God, I loved you so much, once a week I got up in the middle of the night just because I wanted to be with you. And because Father Larry made me feel guilty. But the reality is, you decide that you want to do these things because you're in love. And see, gentlemen, when you go, there is no one on this earth that will love you like God. Nobody. I know I come off very strong, and some of you are like, <laughs> they always come to me and say, Father, I have not been yelled at since I was a teenager. Oh, I feel bad. No, I don't. The reality is that I'll do anything to get your attention. I'll do anything to make you mad. Because tonight when you're laying in bed and you're thinking and praying for my death and you're saying, I can't stand him. I can't. I will not. I am a man. I will not be talked to like by this man. I can't stand him. I hope he dies. You'll still have to deal with everything I said now, won't you? You'll still be thinking about it. You'll be mad at me but you'll be thinking about it. And see, that's the point. That what has to happen today must become life-changing. If you walk out of here today the same way you walked in, you wasted your time. And I wasted two days of my life to come here. Something gotta change. And what that means is we got, if we are not growing, gentlemen, what are we doing? Dying. So if I was to ask you, let's go a year ago. Let's say your life. Let me go one year ago. Tell me about your prayer life. Has it grown any, what you did last year at this day, and what you're doing today? Have, can you show me the way you have grown spiritually? And if the answer is, well, no, Father, I, I do pretty much the same thing today than I did then. Well, then you're dead. Growth is what's necessary for life. So you need to be growing closer to God. So what is God calling you to? Again, you're in the middle of Lent. And please, I hope there's not a soul here that what you do for Lent. I gave up chocolate again, Father. Oh, really? How about you, 12? You know, really? That's what you gave up? So your whole, your whole Lent, you're focused on yourself? I can't wait till Easter so I can have some chocolate. Or some of you, I gave up pop. <laughs> or I was... I can't even go into that. Anyway, so these people, that they're going to give up these things, and I say, oh, Jesus died for you, and you gave up chocolate for him. Whoa. What does he want of you? He wants you to give up time for him. He wants you to say, Jesus, this is, Lent is all about you. It's not about me. I want to spend time with you, Jesus, so I can love you more. Because when we only give up these other little things, who do we stay focused on all of Lent? Ourselves. It's all about what I've done, how hard it is to give up chocolate. Or you, some of you, like, I have a lot of friends, you know, priests, they, they, all, they all give up drinking for Lent. And they're great fun to be around. But anyway, so, they'll come over the house and I'll say, you want to drink? No, it's Lent. Oh, great. Okay, that's fine. But again, though, all they're thinking is, boy, I wish I could have a drink right now. Instead of like, Jesus, I'm going to spend extra time with you. So I don't, the whole point of this is when we're talking about surrender, we're talking about him first. We're talking about our time with God every day first. Because, gentlemen, like I once did a, uh, a youth conference up in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And there was eight bishops behind me. It was the first youth conference ever up there. And uh, some of these bishops are good friends of mine now. But as they're standing behind me, they're all sitting there. It was at Mass, Friday night, beginning of 2,000 high school kids that are there. And I started off my homily, and I said, Kids, you got two choices. You become a saint, or you go to hell. Well, you should have seen the bishops' faces. <laughs> They sent me a video. Every one of them looked constipated right there. Like, ah! the first thing to say to these kids. By the end, we got a standing ovation by those kids. But I wanted to make it clear. I wanted to shock them. To say, because, remember the opening this, of the talk? 
is called is surrender and what? Go to heaven. And that's the point. You either have this desire to become a saint, and you become a saint, or you're going to go to hell. There is no in-between, gentlemen. Even if you go to purgatory, you're on your way to heaven. So you got to make that. You either become a saint, or you go to hell. And the way you're going to become a saint is that you're going to surrender every day, and you're going to talk about your prayer. And we're going to talk about love the next talk. It's a shorter talk. They gave me less time the next time. I don't get it. But anyway, so... But here we got to really focus on you must become a man of prayer. So gentlemen, before you leave this to go to lunch or go to confession, I want you to make a promise to God. God, I promise you the rest of my life, I will give you five minutes a day. If you can't do that, turn in your man card. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless, keep, and protect you. He who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. See you next uh, thing. Have fun.